Happy Sunday. You survived the soggy, stormy Sunday. Well done. We know this is one of those weekends where people kind of watch online. So for all those that are online right now, we love you very much. We wish you were here, but we understand you could not weather the storm. So we understand. Uh, again, happy Sunday. We're excited for all that God is doing uh, here at the church. And just we have an annual praise reports that we kind of do for our different departments and ministries. So that's available in the lobby for anyone here that's a rock partner, a rock member here. You've gone through our culture course. You can go to the lobby. You can put, sign your name down and receive one of those reports just to celebrate some of the amazing Amazing things that God has done here with our outreach, with our community center. And again, just seeing the strategic partnerships that God is beginning to form where we're already a very active local and global missions church, uh, now really seeing a strategic uh, implementation where this really, this community is going to be revolving around this church community center. But how many of us know the church is not a building, it's the people of God? And that is us that are here. So again, thank you for those that volunteer and contribute. Uh, and then in addition, I got an update from Pastor Bob in Iraq right now. Have you been praying? We've been praying for Pastor Bob. Uh, really important. So last night, I got, yesterday, I got a text. He said, I just officially met the toughest woman I've ever met on the planet. Uh, and he was with a uh, Iraqi special ops agent that was helping with the uh, over overseas refugee crisis. And he's there. And he sent the picture. He said, we could not show it. I'm sure he will probably show it. Uh, and then last night, got a text at 1030. He was meeting with some dignitaries and some high-end officials about the crisis. They're viewing him as the, kind of the nonprofit expert, believe it or not. So there's Pastor Bob coming in uh, the middle of the crisis. So again, continue to to pray that there for a couple more days. Pray for Robbie uh, as well. I haven't got any reports of any sickness or anything like that. So thank you again for prayers of protection. But let's really believe that the impact that Bob and others are making there right now uh, will be lasting fruit, fruit that remains. We, we have seen an unusual amount of opportunities open up in the Middle East just in these last few months with Pakistan and now Iraq and Syria. So let's continue to pray for God to do that work there that only he can. And then uh, today we start an awesome new series called Right on Time. How many know that God's timing is different than our timing? God's timing is different than our ways. And uh, we're just going to be talking about what the provision of God looks like, what his timing looks like in life or our times of disappointment, times when we don't understand what he's doing. But I wanted to just bring an awareness to one other thing. I have great friends that are going to share today, Matt and Tiffany Loeffler, on their adoption journey. But one exciting development that's happening here is we have a heart for adoption as a church. Many here have been foster parents or have adopted privately. My wife and I adopted two children uh, over the last few years. And again, I've just seen the amazing movement that God's done in many of the families here. So in order for us to kind of build a support network, uh, Eric and Katie Dwyer have kind of led the way with a few other families, we are starting an adoption and foster community group that will begin in January. So there's going to be some more information, some more stories we'll be sharing. And then at the end of January, there'll be an interest meeting. And we really believe that it will go above and beyond those that are in the church here and churches around the area. There is a huge missional opportunity for a lot of families that have adopted but don't have support networks and do not know the Lord. So we really believe that this is going to go beyond just our church, but to those that are really in need, desperate need of community, because adoption is a difficult process. Can we all understand that? Adoption is a journey that doesn't just end with the signing of a contract or a paper in front of a judge. It's a lifetime of investment, and you need an intentional community that understands the journey of an adoptive family. So we're excited with starting there. So we'll continue to let you know more information about that. Do me a favor. We're going to turn you two places in the Bible today. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. We'll start off there, kind of our anchor verse for the series. And you're just going to put a thumb mark into John chapter 11. It'll be a familiar passage for many of us, but really want to shine some fresh light on it in light of what our present series is and how God shows up at times what we least expect. So do me a favor, turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8, and then make a mark in John chapter 11. It says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for those that you brought here right now. In the midst of weather, that's inconvenient. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you like to use these moments to change and transform the lives. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would open up our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to this church this morning. 
That, Lord, we would not go through the routines and the rhetoric and the rituals that we normally are accustomed to. We wouldn't just punch in our time card of church attendance on a Sunday. But, Holy Spirit, what do you have for this moment right now? Jesus, we thank you that you're speaking. Just get that picture of you walking amongst the lampstands of Revelation. You walked amongst the churches of the city. And, God, we thank you that you're walking amongst Roseville right now. And we just pray that we would hear the message that you have for each and every one of us. And as Ryan talked about disappointment this morning at the end of worship, as we talked about you being good, Lord, we pray for those that have undergone massive disappointments, massive struggles, massive setbacks, what would be perceived as failures. And Lord, we thank you that you are the God that does not write us off or give up on us. Just with the eyes closed, I really feel a, a real direct invitation where you feel like you have failed God significantly and you have signed up for disqualification in your life and ministry. The Lord wants you to know that you're not done yet. Your time is not done. Your time is not expired. The good seasons have not passed and they're not behind you. But the Lord says the best days are yet to come. Because he is the God of the future and the past, and his future is bright because he is the light of the world. You are not. So, Holy Spirit, we just pray that whatever oppressive darkness has come against my brothers or sisters right now, the spirit of darkness would be broken over their life. Discouragement and depression would be broken over their life right now in Jesus' name. Eyes closed. You've been in that place. You say, you know what? I've accepted that feeling of failure over my life. Just lift your hand up if that's you. I know that's vulnerable, but God, we just say right now, spirit of qualification and adoption in their life right now. They would know that they're loved, that they're cared for, that they are seen by you, that their time is not done. You have specific purposes. God, we thank you that you used Moses after he escaped from Egypt and was hiding out in the desert, and yet you bring a bush that's on fire. God, we thank you that you gave a promise to Abraham and Sarah when the womb was dead. You said, I promise a son. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you right now. There's no disqualification in Jesus. There's only grace. Grace for a heart that's sensitive to turn, a heart that is sensitive to change. I know it's convenient to move on, but I don't feel we should. So Holy Spirit, we just ask right now for the acceptance that only Jesus can bring would fill every heart here. God, we, we just lay down the religious ritual of attending church because it's December. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, the wind and the fire, the presence of Jesus would fill this house right now. Let's just stand together. Again, I, I have a message I think we're going to share. Um, and it's good. It'll be online. Trust me, 9 a.m. was awesome. But uh, there are invitations the Lord gives us to respond to his spirit that are more important than things we've written on, on paper. So uh, just close your eyes right now. I'm going to invite some to kneel. I know this. you may not be physically able to, but Holy Spirit, we just surrender to your leadership right now. God, I know there are stories and scriptures that we can say, things that have become familiar to us. But we ask, God, that your word, your living word would not become familiar. God, we repent for the familiarness of church. We repent for the familiarness of service times. And we surrender, Holy Spirit, and say, you be the leader of your church again. God, we are sensitive to the words that you've given us through prophets and friends as Mel Tari came here and Joanne came here last week and said, yet again, you guys are at the gates of the city for a reason. And God, we ask in Jesus' name for a move of the Spirit to take place in our city. That God, we as gatekeepers here and we partner with many other churches, we ask Holy Spirit for fresh fire to fall upon every campus around the area. Lord, we lift up Bridgeway Church to you right now. We ask Holy Spirit for a move of power to fill them. We ask for Jesus culture that a move of power would fall upon them. We ask for Bayside that a move of power would fall upon them, that your church would be united. We pray for the Father's House Roseville that a move of power would take place right now. God, we would mark the day and the time that Jesus Jesus showed up in our town. 
Lord, we pray that we would steward the time that you've given us. We would steward what is this present moment as a church. And we ask, Holy Spirit, for sensitivity to your leading. Lord, we, we say we're not waiting for January for change to take place. We're not waiting for January 1 for resolutions to take place. We ask right now, Holy Spirit, change our hearts. Lord, we're sensitive to you where the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And I pray, God, right now for those that need to change habits and behaviors. There's been addictions in your life that have owned you. Do not wait for January 1 to change. Do not wait for January 1 to be free from pornography, to be free from addictions, to be free from those things that oppress you. We declare today is the new day and the day of salvation, says the Lord. And we ask, Holy Spirit, for a turning and a change in each and every one of us, for those that have been far from you, that our relationship would not be comfortable, it would not be conformative, but God, we ask for revival in our hearts to come, that you would bring back and change that which is dead and bring it to life. The verse that we spoke this morning did not preach in last service, but Ephesians 5 says, Arise, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and let the light of Christ shine within you. And we ask for the light, the piercing fire of Jesus, to bring us back to life again. We repent for our deadness. We repent for all those things where we have been whitewashed tombs. Lord, we repent of a religious spirit. If you say, you know what, my heart has been dead towards God. I've been going through the motions. I've been going through the rituals. Of death. You stand up right now. You say, you know what, I'm tired of going through the motions of religion. And I need a fresh heart in my relationship with Jesus. Stand to your feet. Come down to the front right now. This is what repentance looks like. It looks like a changing. It looks like an accountability. If there's there's five or 50 of you. I do not care. We will pray. So Holy Spirit, we ask right now for our brothers and sisters, for a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit to be here. Holy Spirit, would you come? Anybody here, you say, you know what? I need a change in my heart. I've adopted a religious mindset, and I need a fresh revival in my relationship with Jesus. Just come right now. Holy Spirit. We are sensitive leaders. Can you come gather around, lay hands on those that are down front? God, we ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit to begin to move with power. But we thank you that 9 a.m. was a good enough keeper to have online. So, God, we just thank you that you can speak in these moments. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you bring fresh healing and impartation. Impartation of fire. Those that are in your chairs right now, just put your hands on the shoulder of the person next to you. God, we pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit to fill us to be sensitive. Lord, those that are here and are asking, why on earth am I even here right now? Who dragged me in today? God, we thank you that you know the time and the season, that friends and family can arrive here together. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for the freedom that only you can bring, the hope that only you can bring, that there are divine times and divine seasons. And God, we repent on behalf of other church leaders for misrepresenting you. Just right now with eyes closed, you've been in that place, you know what, I've been significantly hurt by church leaders in my life. I've been hurt by staff members at past experiences, or even present. That's you. You know what, I need to forgive those that have taken advantage of me. Lift your hand up right now. Father, we pray that you'd wash away all the unforgiveness in Jesus' name. All the unforgiveness, all the bitterness of heart that only you can bring healing to. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you bring fresh manna. You are the one that brings living bread. And we pray for fresh hunger in our hearts to pursue you, that we not be defined by those hurts of the past. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for a move that only you can bring, a sensitivity that only you can develop. And we ask right now, God, show us. Show us what you have in store. We pray for those here that are in need physically for healing in their body. Lord, we know there's specific words we can give. If that's you right now, you see, you know what? I'm in need of physical healing in my body. I've been in physical pain in some way. Just lift your hand up right now if that's you. If you're lifting your hand, stand up so we can identify you. You see, you know, I have physical pain in my body. I need prayer for healing. Stand up right now if you're able to stand. Church, uh, lift your hand. Keep your hand lifted if that was you. Church, let's just go around right now and pray for those who are lifting their hand. Father, we just ask right now for healing. Keep your hand lifted till someone's praying for you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. that you are above and beyond all we can ask or imagine. We just declare all pain to leave everybody in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, we pray for every diagnosis, every agreement that was made, every things spoken over by doctors. We thank you that you are the one that define our diagnosis, not a doctor. Lord, we pray for the reversal of type 2 diabetes right now in Jesus' name. Early onset diabetes, we ask for healing, blood flow to return, insulin levels to be balanced in Jesus' name. God, we pray for healing of any type of addiction, of alcoholism, and nicotine, marijuana. God, we ask for healing from any type of substance that has ownership over us, we declare that you are the Lord. You are the one that heals. For those that are here that are discouraged of heart and feel like, God, you have not been speaking to them, I pray that this moment would be a healing of the heart that would begin to feel your presence. That, God, there would be a fresh wave of the presence and the fire of the Holy Spirit. God, we command all pain to leave. As I see some people even testing out their injuries now. God, we thank you for improvement. If you raised your hand and needed healing for physical pain, just kind of move your body, test it out. Wave at me if you notice any improvement in anything that you've experienced. Father, we thank you already for the healing that's taking place. We are trusting and expecting that you can move in a significant way. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's just stand together right now. And for those that are able, again, those that are praying down the front, we understand. Just grab the hand of the person next to you. Just grab the hand of the person next to you right now. Father, we just thank you so much for unity in this house. We thank you so much for those brothers and sisters on our left and our right. And we just ask, God, that those that are lonely would find family in you. They would know that there's brothers and sisters whose names they know not but they care. My God, I pray that this would be a house of healing, a house of hope, restoration. God, we thank you that we don't have to be bound by time, but we're led by your spirit. We are expectant for what you have this morning and for the rest of the day in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Give some hugs around. It's not just handshake time. Not just handshake time. Welcome to church, everyone. You've been around long enough. That's not a normal one. Come on. Where do we go after that one, huh? Let's just be open to that stuff, can we? Can we agree? You know, for us, we just got to have our antennas up and be expectant. I mean, if you enter into a revival, church services don't look normal. But God's power is better than our normal. And so... We just have to be open for that. So, Jesus, we just thank you again for whatever message we're going to preach now. <laughs> the few verses we'll bring up. We're sensitive. Sensitive to your leadership. I thank you for Matt and Tiffany's story, which we will share. I do feel it's important. We're expecting. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Time's an interesting concept. We agree. There are those of us here that are on-time people. Any on-timers out there? Any punctual types. You can say the date and the time in passing, and you know you're going to show up at your friend's house. Not even on time, but maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes early. Any of those people here? You're there. You're early. You always show up. You're the person that walks in awkwardly, and the people are like, oh, we're still getting ready. And you say, how can I help? And there's that awkward silence at the door for a minute. We know those types. You're great. We love you on the team. But then there are those that run on their own time. We love you. We love you so much. And I want to just speak on behalf of those that are not punctual. They do care about you. They genuinely care. They love you. They just don't love your time frame. And I know the struggle as one of those on-time discipline types. I know the struggle. You, you tell them that dinner is at 6.30. And you've prepared and you've planned. And you've budgeted in 30 minutes of their lateness. And you've prepped dinner for 7. Yet magically, they know inside. You cannot trick them. They know, they have some strange math formula in their mind where they know to show up at 7.15 anyway. (laughs) See, we have those that are on time and those that run on their own 
time. But there's also places that do the same thing. There's businesses that have similar philosophies. You have on-time places like FedEx, right? FedEx is an on-time company. They promise certain times of delivery. However, there are other places that are on their own time, like the DMV. God bless the DMV. All of us are obligated to go at one time or another. I pray my children get to experience the DMV and it doesn't go away. It's a rite of passage to go to the DMV and experience that pain. Because you're there and you, you literally plan your whole day. Did you know that they just outlawed people selling DMV appointments? There were companies set up that would auction off appointment times. I'm not kidding you. Yes. Prof, I know, right? I would pay $15 for that. They just outlawed this in California. God bless the DMV. But you go there and you prepare all day. I mean, you bring books. You bring work assignments because you know you're stepping into a time vortex you know you don't know when you're going to get out of. Even though you have an appointment and they give you that number. And you're there and you're waiting for your number to call. But it always seems to show up when you least expect you here. B40. B40. Right? You know that was a good impression, wasn't it? <laughs> and you're there and you get your stuff and then you hear B41. B41. And you're like, I promise. I'm coming. I'm just getting my stuff. They run on their own time. And it wasn't until international business really developed that we started to understand it's not just people, it's not just places, but even countries run on their own time. Cultures run on their own time. And sociologists coined this phrase, there's two types of people, there's two types of businesses, there's two types of cultures. There are monochronic cultures, which are single task oriented people and places. And there are polychronic cultures that are multiple tasks at multiple time frames. Here's a list. Monochronic, one thing at a time. Rigid approach to time. Strict agenda. Focus on task. Polychronic, multiple activities at once. Flexible approach to time. No strict agenda, but here's the kicker. They focus on relationship. All oh, you're like, oh, I know which time Jesus is on, right? So we understand that our friends that are critically late all the time, they actually care more about people than we do. That's just the truth of it. But what we've noticed is this, is that cultures fall into one of these categories, and they came up with this scale, and here's this scale, of monochronic and polychronic cultures. Do we have that scale? There it is. Far left is the U.S. and U.K., and the far right is the polychronic cultures. We are the most time-sensitive culture in the world. I would technically argue that Germany should be right in there with us, but for some reason they left it off. We are a time-bound culture. We are obsessed with time, time-keeping, time-telling, time-holding. But where did this obsession with time actually come from? Why is it embedded in our culture's DNA? See, when you look at time, the concept of time, pre-times of Jesus, most people ran off the daylight clock. That's all they had. Sunrise, sunset. They then developed what they called the lunar calendar. It was around the, the month of the moon. Followed by the solar calendar. The calendar of the year, our rotation around the sun. At that time, they believed it was the sun rotating around the earth. So we had these basic calendars, but the Egyptians tried to figure out how to tell time during the day, so they created a sundial. And the sundial would cast these shadows to determine the time of the day. However, that technology was rendered ineffective on cloudy days like today. So they couldn't tell time. Shortly afterwards, the Chinese developed what they call the water clock. Do we have those pictures? There we go. Down in the middle, you'll see the, the water clock here. So they have a series of buckets that would all determine times and hours. Then after that was the candle clock, top right, which would determine the wick of the candle mixed with the melting of the wax to distinguish different time segments. Finally, the hourglass in the bottom left. Magellan was known to have 18 hourglasses on his ship that would all be successive in time, so he knew where he was going at what time he was going. 
But it wasn't until the 1500s that Galileo, in his obsession with science, needed to define minutes and what he called seconds. How could he count a second? And he came up with this pendulum mechanism they called a pendulum clock. And 50 years later, a man named Christian Huygen, we believe, I can't even say his name, in Germany was credited at inventing the clock. And he took Galileo's invention here and perfected it. And since that time, the clock has now been a part of Western European culture. It's been integrated in. Now, we've perfected it over time. We learned that quartz had a certain time frequency. We used quartz-based clocks to help tell the seconds. And now we have the atomic clock, which has an atomic second, which is 9 billion movements of an atom per second. That's the atomic clock. But our culture became obsessed with time as time continued to develop that even our entertainment demanded a time to fit in our schedule. Thus, in the 70s, 80s, we saw the invention known as the TV Guide. The TV Guide was introduced. Anybody remember this archaic document that your grandparents would have in their house? But the TV Guide's greatest enemy was another invention of the time called the video cassette recorder known as the VCR. And those that are young here do not know the pain of trying to program a VCR. You could always tell who was technologically savvy in your friends or your family members because they had the blinking 12 on their VCR. We all remember this. We became obsessed with keeping time, with holding time. And today we are ran by these digital devices where we constantly know what time it is. And has created the illusion that time is something that we have control of. And time is on our terms. That we can tell our friends when to meet us. We can tell our friends when to show up. We can tell our friends when will he arrive. And we like to tell God when his promises can be fulfilled. But let me tell you, church, God's kingdom runs on its own clock. God's kingdom has a different frequency of time that we're called to tune into. And he warned his church, he warned the Pharisees. In Matthew 16, make note of this, verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Verse 2, he answered, when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. We're really good at telling God what our situation looks like. We're really good at telling him how dire the situation is, but we're not too good at hearing what the kingdom of heaven has in store. And God's clock, his kingdom culture, is different than our clock that we have placed on him. He says this in Isaiah 55, for my time is better than your time. My ways are better than your ways. My alarms are better than your alarms. They're higher than your alarms. Yet, if you listen and be sensitive to what my spirit is saying to you in the moment, you'll see what the kingdom plan has in store. Our series is called Right on Time. God's promises are right on time, but they're not always our time. And for many of us who are here today, you've had promises you've held, things you've held on to. God's spoken to you. You have confirmation that he has spoken and yet they are unfulfilled and you resolve alongside of the enemy. You've made agreements that God failed on his promise but he's come to tell you today the best is yet to come. And our promises, his promises don't have our time frames. And we see this time and time again throughout Scripture. And as we look at the arrival of Jesus on the scene in Jerusalem, everyone would have said that was the wrong time for the Messiah to come. Christopher Hitchens, the famous atheist, 
One of his main arguments was the cruelty of God to delay the salvation of the world for so many thousands of years. And he called this debate with a famous philosopher named William Lane Craig, held at Biola's campus. Big deal debate. Now, normally, William Lane Craig would only debate someone if they had scholarly credentials. Now, Hitchens was just known as a philosopher, just known as someone that would write articles. But he agreed to the debate. And Hitchens laid out his argument of the cruelty of God. He talked about evolution and all these different plans and, and things that God would delay in. And he, and he led with his main argument being this. Why would he delay the arrival of a Savior? And to which Craig gets up and replies, you know, I can understand how you've deducted that it was the wrong time. It was actually right before the population growth of the world took place. And God brought his Savior at the right time because there was a medium of communication of his salvation message through papyrus. There was also the Roman roads in which it would travel. God's time is the right time. The entire stadium was silent after that accusation came. See, we serve a God that knows a specific moment and a specific time. And if you've ever been a part of a fulfilled promise, you would always say this, man, I wish I could have had it sooner, but God knew what he was doing. He always does. And this week, you can hear online, John chapter 11. But I'll say this to us before we invite up Matt and Tiffany. The book of John is a unique gospel. Very different gospel than the other gospels. We believe it was written in the late 80s, early 90s, as John's on this island called Patmos. Now, when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all share similar stories. And when you read John, the stories are incredibly different. Now, for those that are those monochronic types that like things linear and in order, anybody else here with me? John writes things out of order. Let me just let you in. So you've tried to reconcile the time schedule. John writes things out of order on purpose. And one of the main ones we get caught up on is in John chapter 2, right after the wedding at Cana, it says that G Jesus goes to the temple and overturns the tables in the temple. You ever read that passage? People are like, well, maybe Jesus did this twice. He probably didn't do it twice. But what John is doing is he's letting us in to how he's writing his gospel, where Jesus invades the religious system and he overturns the tables. And what John is setting precedence for is that Jesus will often overturn our expectations. And throughout the entire gospels, we notice this pattern where the miracles that John selects are ones that were very culturally not acceptable. Miracles that were not accepted. And one that's highly debated is John chapter 11. It's the resurrection of Lazarus. Or if you're going to get stickler, resuscitation of Lazarus, whatever you want to call it. John 11, this story, they would say, well, why is it then that the other gospels don't include this if it's such a significant miracle? Why would they leave this out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Many believe this. Number one, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke probably had Lazarus as a contemporary. And Lazarus was a leader of the early church, and his reputation was well known. The other element of this in support for the evidence of Lazarus is we actually found the tombs of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus just outside of the town of Bethany in the late 1800s that sealed the deal that they were probably leaders of an early church in a town called Bethany. So what happens is this, is Jesus is just outside the city, he's 20 miles away from the town of Bethany, and this message comes and says, Jesus, the friend whom you love, Lazarus, is ill. In the Jewish culture, it was a, a, a unique culture where you didn't have direct communication. You couldn't speak directly to someone, especially a female could not speak directly to a male, especially of someone of Jesus' status. So they send this message, it's called this impolite, you know, uh, indirect communication, or polite indirect communication. So they send it his way. He then tells the messenger, behold, this sickness will not lead to death, but it is for what? The glory of God. This is what he shares with this messenger. This messenger probably left, they were 20 miles away, probably left in the early morning, arrives to Jesus at the noonday, and runs with the message back. Now, the community, the family, knew of Jesus' miracles. They knew well of them. 
They knew that Jesus would heal people with his words. And the story of the centurion's servant and the words of Jesus being commanded, they knew that that was probably going to take place. So this messenger runs back with what they would call a gospel or good news that Lazarus's sickness would not end in death. But what happens? Lazarus dies. And it says in the text, in John 11, you can mark it and read it another time. It says, and when Jesus knew that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. Now, culturally, especially for someone of his position, it was of greatest priority to abandon any good work to serve those in your family. And Lazarus was considered family. And yet Jesus delays two days. Rudolf Boltman says it well. The work of Jesus has its own hour. The work of Jesus has its own hour, its own time, its own clock. And it says he arrives on the tomb in John eleven seventeen 17, on what? The fourth day. Now, why is John specified the fourth day? See, it was a very superstitious culture that actually invited a lot of pagan beliefs into it. And they believed that the soul of the person hovered above the body for three days. And on the fourth day, that soul would go and rest in Sheol. That's what they believed. So John is very specific and says that they arrived when? The fourth day. The fourth day because they knew that Lazarus was fully dead. There was no hope. There was no coming back. There was no possible resuscitation to take place. And what we see is this, is that Martha leaves the house and confronts Jesus. She storms up to Jesus when she sees that he is coming. He, he, she hears that he's coming, and she says, if you would have been here. Now, Martha in Scripture gets a really bad rap. We know about Martha. Martha's none of the one, busy in the kitchen, reprimanding Mary, who's at the feet of Jesus. But here's the deal. I want to I speak up for Martha. She was commanded, according to cultural rules, to be in a state of seven-day deep mourning, followed by 30 days of light mourning. She was commanded to sit in a position called Shiva. She could not put shoes on, and she could not leave the house, and especially could not confront a rabbi. She puts her shoes on, gets her dress back on, stops over to Jesus and says, you should have been here. My friends... We have to break our religious norms in our relationship with Jesus. We have to learn to get honest with God and stop all the religious rhetoric that we're so used to. Put your shoes on. Speak to Jesus. Because he says this, Hebrews 4, approach his throne of grace, what? Boldly. It's time to get honest, and we have to pre stop pretending like Jesus is this fragile Savior that maybe will hurt his feelings if we're honest. Jesus doesn't need a college safety zone or safe space with you. Get honest with Jesus. Share with them, because what happens is we bury these resentments, we bury disappointments, and then we wonder why we're angry with God, because we didn't talk it out. She confronts it. Jesus promises that he's the resurrection life. He gives her an invitation. And what we believe is this, is that Martha thought that if Jesus was there, Lazarus would be healed because he's a righteous man, and the righteous prayers avail much. That's what they believed. But he was coming to show her he wasn't some miracle worker or faith healer. He was God among them. And says, I am the resurrection and the life. The same term used for Yahweh is now found in Jesus. This is a big moment for her journey with Jesus. He then has an interaction with Mary, similar situation. He then goes to the tomb, and the famous passage that many make fun of, and it's totally inappropriate, Jesus wept. We make jokes about it being the shortest verse in the Bible. John is incredibly intentional. Because at that time, in that culture, guess what? Greco-Roman gods were emotionless. 
Why were they emotionless? Because they believed that if you had emotions, others had power over you. And what Jesus shows in this moment is that the God of the universe cares, he sees, and he weeps along with you. And he's inviting you to be in relationship with him, to weep alongside of him, and that he knows that your place of pain is a place that only he can comfort. And he stands in that tomb, and he says, remove the stone. And they're shocked. Because here's the deal. He's not just saying that he will be defiled, but he's going to defile the whole community because the presence of the dead body has been there for four days. And they look at him, and he said, didn't I tell you you would see the glory of God? The glory of God will cost you everything if you're willing to say yes to it. And it looks like you're rolling things back that you declared dead. It looks like you rolling back the stone of your heart that you have closed off. And he says with this commanding, loud voice that Lazarus would come forth. And the way the scholars say it's written in Greek, it's the same type of voice that spoke the world into existence. And in order for you to get the healing that Jesus is inviting you into, you have to pull back that stone and allow the voice to enter in. You have to allow the voice, the living word of Jesus, to enter into that place of pain. And the miracle's ready. The healing's ready. I can't promise the outcome of your expectations on this side of eternity, but the responsibility is in your court for rolling back the stone. Will we allow the voice to enter in? Will you allow the healing to take place? Will you allow Jesus to bring back those dead dreams? Because only he can.